Okay. So, to begin, could you please state your full name? My name is Paul Harold Macklin. And your age, please? My age is 71. And uh, where were you born? I was born in Coburg, Ontario. Where we are at the moment. And um, what, uh, what did your parents do when you were young? My parents were farmers and uh, primarily, well, I, originally they were uh, produce farmers and then became dairy farmers and uh, had a f full herd of Holstein Frisian cattle. Okay. And what did you do as a child for uh, fun or, or did you help out? To... Well, as the oldest child on a farming operation, it's obviously uh, the job to uh, learn the trade. And so I spent um, uh, my first 18 years actually being the lead hand uh, once I was able to. Started driving vehicles at about age six. And uh, the usual thing that happens on the farming of, or the farm of that day. Um, so it was, a, it was truly a family farm. Okay. And, um, and uh, what, uh, at school, what were your favorite subjects or your strongest subjects? Or your interests? My interests when I was in school, I, I think were just uh, general. I really, to be blunt, didn't know what I would like to do in terms of uh, post-secondary education. And um, I only had one member of our family who had actually gone on to um, uh, receive a university degree. So it was uh, interesting when uh, it came time to leave high school and determine where you were going to go. And as a matter of fact, one of my friends actually applied for me. You can believe that. And um, so I, I got into uh, Huron College at Western uh, University of Western Ontario. And uh, there I uh, basically did an arts degree with majors in psychology and zoology. And um, I guess there was some interest potentially to go into medicine, but I uh, uh, abandoned that particular direction and uh, went on to uh, uh, take a... Uh, uh, teacher's training course at OISE uh, at the University of Toronto. And following that, I went out to uh, Mississauga and uh, at Gordon Graydon Secondary School. Uh, I uh, had the opportunity to uh, teach grades 9 and 10 science. But I found that after a year that wasn't something that I really wanted to do. So, uh, although I guess in the end I likely ended up being a teacher for the rest of my days, but it was not in the formal sense. And uh, so I went to um, then to the University of Windsor, which was starting a law school, and um, I graduated from there. I came back, did my articles in Toronto, and uh, um, went to practice with a firm called Davies Ward and Beck. And uh, there I practiced uh, corporate securities law and uh, taxation, uh, which was something that I again, quickly tired of after a couple of years and uh, came back out here to the country and uh, in a rural area and practiced law there for another 25 years approximately in a general way. And uh, during that period of time, I was an advocate for various economic issues. And so I, I, I tended to be one who was promoting uh, economic growth in our area. And after that, I suppose that may be what attracted some people to suggest that I should run for Parliament. And uh, So were, it was other people's uh, it was other suggestions? It was right? other people's suggestions. Okay. This was not my... Uh, although I had been asked to run provincially a few years before, and I simply declined, I, I just didn't see it as something that uh, was in my uh, pattern that I wanted to pursue. Um, but I, I had a change of heart, I guess, after enough people approached me and, and ultimately decided to run for Parliament. And um, as luck would have it, and I do say luck because, quite frankly, I think it's uh, there are so many good people run for parliamentary posts. And uh, you have to be in the right place at the right time with the right party. And, and that's being very blunt. And I was lucky. And, um, and they reminded us of that on the day we arrived in Parliament and said, realize that you're only here because you're fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I found that um, my introduction to Parliament was um, very, very uh, basic. Uh, I, I was coming, yes, from a legal background and, and understanding how to use laws, but not necessarily fully uh, appreciating how laws were created nor appreciating um, 
possibly the the way in which laws are created isn't always as pure as one would like to think. Um, that's why they sometimes say that you don't want to know how laws and sausages are made. Uh, and it, it's quite true. Uh, in a majority government situation, you, you can get the full force of the philosophy that's being advanced. But when you come into a minority government situation, it's the story of putting water in your wine. And uh, therefore, you do get uh, what I would call uh, impurities in the philosophy you're trying to pursue. Others would argue that actually you're, you're listening to the broader democratic uh, voice and you're actually uh, coming forward with laws that meet others' concerns more broadly. And uh, that may be true. Um, however, um, in, in the case uh, of Westray, we are really talking about um, uh, a majority government situation and uh, we were able to go forward uh, more or less to try to meet the, the goals that um, had been set out. Mm -hmm. uh, what year did you uh, enter office? I entered office in uh, November of 2001. Okay. And, Excuse uh, me, two, yeah, 2000. 2000? Yes, 2000, okay. because 2001 came up quickly thereafter and then 2002 I did get involved in the justice ministry. Okay. And um, you had mentioned Westray, uh, the Westray mining disaster. Uh, that happened in 1992. Um, yes. In, in your words, could you say what, uh, what you remember from that event or what, that event, well, what happened? Well, when I, was, uh, when I was outside of Parliament, of course, um, was when that occurred. And, uh, but I did go back and sort of have to learn about Westray in order to properly appreciate what we were trying to do in terms of legislation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I found it interesting because, you know, you see, here we have a person who, uh, Clifford uh, Frame, who was the uh, owner of Cura Resources, and um, he, in, I think, 1988, announced that he was going to open a mine in, uh, in Sydney, um, or Plymouth, sorry, Pl Plymouth, uh, Nova Scotia. And um, I guess the history of... Uh, Plymouth was such that uh, they'd had a, a number of mines there over the course of time. And yes, they'd had previous explosions uh, because uh, m when you're mining coal, coal and, and methane gas are, uh, are common uh, friends uh, in that uh, way. So he announced that he was going to uh, open a mine there. And uh, so he went about trying to raise the financing. and. I think uh, part of the story is that uh, the federal government helped finance in some respects. The provincial government of Nova Scotia helped finance in some respects. And in the end, um, both parties were heavily uh, into the support of this mine. Um, and uh, including Nova Scotia agreeing to buy uh, 275,000 tons of coal every year from the mine. And this was a, quite an economic driver in the area, and each of the parties involved were interested in the economics. I mean, obviously, the, the federal government and the, and the province wanted to make sure they had uh, lots of employment, and uh, the, the uh, owner obviously wanted to make sure he could make a return on the, the, his investment. And I think that all works into the theory of well, so many of these cases where people get intertwined economically and then um, other issues start to develop. In this particular case, it was uh, fairly early on that they recognized that, that, and I say they being the provincial authorities, recognized that the plan for the mine wasn't going ahead exactly as, as they thought. And uh, in some respects, uh, the, the mine was... Well, first of all, they didn't think that the, the uh, miners were properly trained. They felt that uh, there hadn't been uh, a, an emergency plan put in place. They found out that, you know, very early on in this process that they were starting to uh, mine in a direction that they hadn't previously stated they were going to do. And so all of a sudden, they're almost uh, foretelling of, of what might 
ultimately occur. And uh, so they started the mine in, um, in uh, September of uh, 1991. And uh, once the mine uh, opened, uh, I guess there were some pretty early warning signs of the problems that were about to uh, pers ultimately um, be pursued because what happened was they had a few uh, roof falls. Uh, they had problems with, um, with uh, as I say, no emergency plan and, and, and the provincial authorities started to observe that this was happening. And um, you know, at one point they even said they were going to pull the permit on the on the mine, and that would be the provincial authorities. But um, as it went on, the, the next thing that seemed to be a, a problem in the mine was the amount of uh, coal dust that was allowed to accumulate. And um, as one learns, coal dust is a very explosive uh, type of particle once it's been suspended. And especially when you combine it with a, almost like an ignition stage in methane gas. So if it lights, uh, you have this incredible potential for explosion. And uh, in, this, in this process, I think that uh, everyone came to the understanding that we were dealing in a very dangerous uh, commodity. And yet at the same time, and I heard rumors personally from people later that uh, in order to keep the mine going and to keep everything operating, that they were, uh, there were actually attempts at uh, taking uh, devices that were to stop vehicles from operating when methane gas got too uh, high in, in its concentration, that they were being modified so that they could carry on and, and, and work. And uh, that, to me, I don't know whether it was fact, but certainly was rumored from people I spoke with uh, during this process. And you could understand, because everyone was caught between uh, trying to be safe and go home at night, and yet at the same time make a living and not be shut down, or um, find that uh, the mine itself would close. So um, a lot of conflict. Uh, positions, uh, everyone cheering for them to go forward, and yet at the same time knowing that they were working really on a precipice, that if anything did go wrong it would be serious consequences. And um, they, the provincial government even came along and, and at one point asked that they um, uh, get rid of this coal dust, and um, they called it, um, have it stone dusted, which is taking another aggregate ground up and it somehow minimized the uh, the amount of uh, coal dust that would be in the air. But then the mine was only open for eight months, you know, which is quite amazing. And then of course on May the 9th of uh, 1992, uh, the report is that a, a mining machine ignited methane gas and the methane gas then combined with the coal dust and had this enor enormous explosion with 26 miners being killed and uh, only 15 bodies ever being recovered. Uh, they finally just entombed the rest and left them there. And the, yet the mine manager, right after the explosion, was making a statement publicly that this was as safe a mine as there is. Well, I, I think ultimately that was proven not to be so. And once the... Uh, explosion and recovery efforts were finished, uh, the province uh, tried to take action right away and uh, they appointed uh, Mr. Justice uh, Peter Richard to uh, take on an inquiry. Now here we are in uh, 1992. His inquiry really never got, for various reasons, never really got rolling till I think 1995. Um, because I, again, uh, one can only sit back and speculate as to what was going on in the politics of, of the day. But uh, within a few months after the event, the provincial authorities came in and, and laid uh, some 50 plus charges against um, mine managers and the company. And uh, those charges um, 
weren't in place all that long because what happened was the the uh, the uh, RCMP decided they were going to investigate criminally, and they did, and they started investigating. And so as soon as uh, the RCMP had taken on the criminal investigation, it wasn't very long before the the 52 provincial uh, charges were actually dropped, and they were, therefore the the RCMP at that point was carrying. Uh, the uh, load in terms of investigation and uh, potential criminal charges. And um, in 1993, the RCMP did lay criminal charges of uh, uh, manslaughter and criminal negligence causing death, and they charged um, both the company and uh, two mine managers, as I recall. And the trial on that now we're we're now speaking in 1995, uh, so it was two years after that that the trial started, and uh, it wasn't very long before those charges were stayed, uh, because in fact there'd been uh, legal imperfections. In particular, there hadn't been proper disclosure uh, between the uh, defense and and Crown, so those charges were gone. So here we are in 1995 with no provincial charges having been successfully um, followed through because they were withdrawn. We have the criminal charges that are thrown out by the court. And now the only way we're going to find any, any, any hope of resolution and, and uh, I suppose responsibility being assessed is only through uh, Mr. Justice Richard's inquiry. So Mr. Justice Richard did carry on with his inquiry. As I say, it didn't really get going again until 1995. Now here we are way some years from, from the original explosion in 1992. Now he brought out his report in 1997, so two years later. So here a, a tremendous period of time has passed. There has not been any, any resolution that's uh, meaningful. The public and, and the, the victims' families are, are really uh, very distressed at this uh, proposition. So in 1997, um, when the report came out, I, I felt, uh, when I went back and looked, uh, one of the most telling statements about this entire event it was a quote, and I will quote uh, Mr. Justice uh, Peter Richard. He said, this is a story of incompetence, of mismanagement, of bureaucratic bum bungling, of deceit, of ruthlessness, of cover-up, of apathy, of expediency, and of cynical indifference." End of the quote. And you know, the more you study and look at the situation, you came to understand that he was so right in his assessment of what had gone on. And what that means is, at the end of the day, is the process that we had in place was just not effective and uh, certainly didn't give any uh, recourse for families to pursue. And uh, so 1992, the explosion and its aftermath was significant. But one of his recommendations uh, of Mr. Peter Richard was uh, recommendation number 73 in which he he really asked that the government of Canada, uh, through the Department of Justice, institute a study on accountability uh, for corporate executives and uh, directors uh, for wrongful or negligent acts of a corporation, and that we should introduce through the Parliament of Canada a process whereby we would modify uh, the criminal code or other, other statutes as necessary in order to uh, uh, make the workplace and the owners and operators of those workplaces m properly accountable for workplace safety. And um, I, I think that was what really triggered, uh, I think, a great deal of, of the ultimate process in Parliament. In Parliament itself, what we found was that the New Democratic Party was instrumental in working with the steel workers, the United Steel Workers, and I, I, I can't say enough about the United Steel Workers and, and the way in which they pursued uh, this on behalf of 
their workers and the, and the families. Um, they were a constant uh, in all the proceedings that I participated in in uh, Parliament. In, um, in February, I think the first of the private members' bills, this is 1999, now the report came out from Mr. Justice Richard in 1997, and in 1999 we have the first appearance of uh, a uh, private members' bill in the House of Commons. And the House of Commons, um, again, private members' bills are used quite frequently to raise awareness and to try to encourage the government, but rarely do they actually go through and become law themselves, or at least not frequently. So in this particular case, the NDP uh, had over a period of time four private members' bills that came forward, and um, in April of 1999, uh, uh, the Honorable Peter McKay had his motion that he brought forward. Again, everyone is trying to raise the uh, and elevate the debate on this issue. And um, he brought forward a, a motion that was debated, and it was to get corporate executives and directors to be held properly accountable for workplace safety. And in that he uh, did help in the process, and this was, of course, his writing where this, where this uh, mine disaster had occurred. So uh, he had a very strong interest in moving it forward. And when, uh, when it was talked about and debated in the House, what were the general reactions from the rest of the House and the Senate? Generally speaking, uh, the, the reactions were uh, a great deal of sympathy, a great deal of, of understanding uh, as to what had gone on. Uh, I think the uh, major concern that seemed to arise in all of the discussions, and even as we worked our way into a more formal bill, uh, was a chill, I think one could say, about the corporate responsibility. I, I think... Um, it extended beyond just the natural resource industry. It extended into, for example, uh, people who uh, held uh, volunteer positions in other organizations. They were equally uh, concerned about um, their responsibility, and especially if you're a volunteer, um, how would you how how would you seek volunteers if, in fact, they were potentially going to have a, an incredible liability that followed with it. So I think the feeling that everyone got was a sense of, of, of a chill in the broader community of what this might mean. Yes, I think everyone accepted the fact that there should be more responsibility, but I believe that um, making responsibility more um, elevated in the corporate structure uh, where people didn't necessarily control the situation, but yet could be considered to be the directing mind, is where the, the whole issue started to uh, become a bit dicey, uh, because if you don't control the situation, you don't necessarily want to be liable. But the way that you deal with that liability is to do all things that are reasonable. Uh, and uh, expected uh, to uh, make the workplace safe. So uh, that was sort of the sense that was there. Um, there was a sense, though, within the uh, community, uh, and I say that community of, uh, of stakeholders, that, uh, that there still was a need. But whether, whether we were reaching too far uh, was the next question. So in... in um, in 2002, um, when I just be, had become the parliamentary secretary, we were engaged in, in uh, pursuing uh, one of these uh, bills that had been referred to the Justice Committee. And uh, we'd called for briefs and we'd called for witnesses. And uh, during the period of time uh, following February of uh, 2002, uh, we heard some 34 witnesses and, uh, again, as I say, received a broad range of briefs from various interested parties. And uh, this all 
came together in a report, and then we uh, that report was brought before the House in uh, June of uh, 2002. And um, it, it was a year after that before um, the government did eventually bring forward the bill. And I guess everyone is always concerned about the passage of time, but I think others are equally concerned about trying to get it right and make sure that the, uh, the legislation reflects the true need and is a remedy uh, for the situation that you see in terms of corporate mentality uh, generally. So uh, we took the time to get it at least what we thought was right. And uh, so we introduced the bill in uh, June of 2003. And uh, with the introduction of the bill, uh, we, as luck would have it, the parliament uh, dissolved the next day and, and um, so that we didn't get any further in June. But when we came back in, um, in September, we uh, began our debate on the issue of uh, the bill and its, uh, well, I guess what we'd say, fundamental reform of uh, this area of corporate liability. And it was substantially fundamental because it was really changing the way in which you looked at corporations. Uh, it, it isn't easy to do that because we know that uh, corporations you, you, you can't imprison. Uh, you, you're, you're left with the reality of dealing primarily in fines. And we did introduce in the bill the concept of probation so that a corporation could be effectively uh, put into a probationary state. Um, the officers and, and, um, and members of the corporation that had control obviously were going to be asked to meet the standard uh, that was required to keep the workplace safe. Now, once we started the debate, um, we, it became fairly obvious that uh, I think, despite the fact that so many years had gone by, I mean, we're talking you know, a decade, basically, mm -hmm. um, that I think that a parliament itself had, had established, yes, they had their, their picky concerns here and there, but at the end of the day, one was really uh, struck with the fact that everyone was sympathetic to the cause. Uh, yes, concerned as to how far it reached, but in reality, the, the bottom line was uh, it was something that was needed, it was necessary, and that because the hearings had been had, the report had been available for a year, They'd had, and, and the bill had been worked on to get it to that stage where we thought, as a government, that it was an appropriate um, way to address the issue. It became obvious after um, the debate had started that the, the Parliament was ready to go forward with this bill. They felt that it was the best they could do at this point, and um, so it was, uh, it was never voted upon uh, on, on a voice vote or anything of that nature, but rather just adopted by Parliament uh, at its uh, second reading. And um, then it uh, went to the committee. Committee only had it for a day, uh, returned it uh, following that, uh, uh, reported back to the House. The House, it, again, adopted the, uh, the report. And um, that was on October the 27th, uh, when it was adopted in the House, which given third reading, which means it's final subject to royal assent. And um, on, onward it went to the Senate, and the, it was introduced in the Senate on the same day, October 27th. And it was interesting because the Senate, um, needless to say, appeared to agree fully with what had gone on in the House. And uh, again, because of the passage of time, I think everyone had pretty much accepted the, uh, the willingness to, to make a change in the uh, law. They uh, simply had, I believe, only one witness, which was Don Piergoff, on behalf of uh, Justice, who came before them as a witness and basically explained the entire process that had been outlined in this new bill. And uh, 
they uh, immediately uh, passed it, and uh, the uh, the law was in place in November of that same year. So it was it was a it was an extremely short period of time. When you really from September the fifteenth to I think about November the what seventh I guess it was when it got a final uh, approval, a very short period of time, and and very for most part unusual in parliamentary process. But I think everyone knew that it was needed and uh, it was therefore adopted and uh, became the law. Hmm. And um, f from it becoming a law, um, did you see or hear of any reactions of the families or the union? You had mentioned the United Steelworkers. Yeah, well, the United Steelworkers were there, and uh, yeah, needless to say, they were they were thrilled. And um, oh yeah, well, when, once it passed the House, I mean, um, you know, to be fair, I mean, they were they were excited, uh, and um, families that we'd see family members from time to time, especially during the hearings, uh, which occurred. Uh, they would come forward and tell us their stories and and you know encourage us as as parliamentarians to go forward and and, and pass legislation that they hoped in the future would stop the potential or at least deter the deten the potential for this type of, of outcome and the united steel workers sure i remember they were so excited that i remember we we got our photographs taken together and it was a it was a time of celebration, really, uh, when when the bill was passed in the in the House of Commons, knowing that the Senate was likely going to approve. Uh, it was seen as as the victory, this long sought victory, after you know, as I say, more than a decade from the event itself. So, uh, I think that the uh, one looking at it, I mean, you you. You thank a lot of people who were involved, but I, I think that uh, there is no question that the United Steelworkers really deserved a lot of credit for their lobbying and their friendly support, and that they were working with the families as much as possible, and making sure that parliamentarians understood the true nature of what had gone on. Uh, parliamentarians may be wonderful people, but they don't have uh, the, the knowledge that that um, the individuals who were front and center at the time have. So it, it is important to make sure that uh, they do get a chance to uh, uh, catch up on all of the details and the background and possible suggestions for how we might remedy the situation. Mm -hmm. And um, the industry throughout the process, um, were, did they, first of all, how did they participate, but were they see, seen more as um, Positive or combative? I, I, there was an element of, of, yeah. of combativeness because, uh, and I say that in a in a in a muted sense, because they were concerned, and they were concerned, and and maybe rightfully so, that this would put them at a very high degree of risk, especially with respect to uh, their upper management and uh, directors. But I don't know where you find the balance. And that, what we were trying to always extend was to them the concept that as long as you did what was reasonable in the circumstances, um, and most people or the, the so-called reasonable man would see this act or these actions that you took as reasonable to make sure the workplace was safe, then we won't necessarily hold you responsible for things that were beyond your control or that in fact uh, would have been outside that reasonable man test. And, but it was hard for them to accept that. So when I say combative, I mean it wasn't truly combative, but it was certainly argumentative um, and trying to press their case. But in the end, we have seen that there haven't been that many situations that have um, attracted this law since it uh, came into force. Uh, maybe a dozen uh, instances where it's been used. And uh, overall, um, I, I think that most of the concerns that were originally expressed by the corporate side have been allayed. Um, but 
I'm not sure that um, all of the volunteer organizations have necessarily accepted it as well. Uh, and uh, But by the same token, I don't think that people are being uh, necessarily killed as frequently mm -hmm. or maimed in the volunteer sector as they certainly are in the um, corporate sector. Uh, so I think the risk just from the beginning is, is much more minimized. And especially when you're into um, natural resource areas as, as this was and other natural resource areas, I mean, there's a greater risk of danger and <clears throat> you just have to try your very best as a corporate, a good corporate citizen to um, minimize that. Mm -hmm. I, when I just interviewed um, last week, Leo Gerard, who's the international president of the United Steelworkers, but originally from uh, Sudbury, um, he had uh, mentioned as well the West Ray uh, bill and said that if you look today, there haven't been a lot of uh, there haven't been a lot of uh, opportunities to, I guess, um, use this law or, or well, impose the law because, in a way, it, it, seem, it seems to have become a much safer environment. Uh, well, I, I would only differ to this extent, that I, I still see that most of the prosecutions that are occurring are provincial or health and safety prosecutions in these events. It seems to be fairly rare that they resort to the criminal level uh, of prosecution. And um, I just noticed um, the sunrise um, the gas explosion uh, uh, in the last week. Uh, uh, there, were, there were a great number of fines and so forth that um, were brought forward. But again, all of those in the end uh, seem to be based on provincial health and safety standards and uh, being prosecuted provincially. So I, again, it's, it's hard to know uh, what the right answer is. Uh, I think the only thing you can say is that if you look at um, the fatalities in the overall, I guess now a couple of decades, um, that you sort of see that uh, the death rate in, in uh, these situations has remained relatively constant. And that being said, uh, I guess one would hope that this, this law, Bill C-45, actually did, in the end, encourage people to be more careful, to be more thoughtful, and to actually keep workplaces uh, safe. Um, I don't think anyone ever goes into any business um, thinking that they aren't going to try to keep things safe. But people get sloppy, they get careless, and they have to be reminded and uh, that's where you hope that inspections and provincial inspections will, will encourage uh, corporations to maintain the highest standard. And the threat that one can always uh, lay before them is if you don't and anything happens, do you realize what the risks are? You know, and, and point to the criminal law as well as the uh, health and safety standards. And I, and I think all of us would like to be moral and upstanding, but at the end of the day, sometimes economics does funny things to the way in which people function. And uh, these things um, are not always positive. And you have to have, I think, and all the law does is simply outline the boundaries where we think you shouldn't go. And, uh, and if you do go outside those boundaries, then we will have a, an appropriate remedy for you. And if you're going to, you can expect that the full force of the law will be brought to bear. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's the one problem about Westray. I mean, there were a lot of people scratching their heads and saying, uh, how could we have gone through this entire process and never uh, ended up with anyone being uh, successfully prosecuted uh, when 26 people's lives were lost in a situation that was monitored and it was a new mine. It was not an old mine that uh, had had historical uh, impact. I mean, yes, they were working on the old Ford seam, which was a, a seam that had been mined before. But this was a new proposal, supposedly using good standards, um, 
but I guess, uh, you know, sometimes you can't anticipate everything and, uh, and yet that's what the standard is that we expect corporate executives to follow. Mm -hmm. They have to make sure that those uh, who are doing the, um, the day-to-day -day direction know the rules, abide by the rules. Mm -hmm. um, there was a case maybe a few weeks ago that came out in the paper about a man who was uh, charged, um, was given jail time for um, for the death of four workers on scaffolding. Yes, yes, uh, that was metric or, or metric or something, something of that yeah. nature. That case, yes. Would that apply? Would Westray uh, build? Well, that uh, would it, uh, the same principles apply? Yes, um, but uh, uh, and uh, again, one can certainly. Uh, uh, get themselves into uh, the, well, again, the full force of the law is open to uh, anyone in those situations because that was clearly an occupational health and safety issue uh, where in fact, they, um, number one, the, uh, the individuals on that scaffolding weren't wearing appropriate uh, protective gear. They weren't tied off. Um, the scaffolding obviously had some fundamental problem with the way in which it had been put together. So, that was clearly a, a situation that this law would have applied to, did apply to, but uh, those who prosecute make decisions on how they're going to prosecute. Uh, and um, the, uh, there are lines of demarcation between provincial and, and federal prosecutions. So it just be, depends on, I guess, the nature of, of, of how serious uh, is the event uh, what level of prosecution do they believe would be effective in sending the message to others? Because in some of these cases, um, the message that you want to send uh, is far better sent with a successful prosecution than it is trying to reach too far and have a, a failure of your prosecution. So in that regard, Again, messages are being sent, yes, and the fact that you go to jail, that's, that does send the message. And uh, the problem, though, with fining is that in some of these cases, the whole purpose of having a limited company uh, that does the work is because you're limiting the liability. So in terms of monetary fines and so forth, there is a point where uh, people will just simply walk away from the company if it doesn't have the asset value or doesn't have the, the uh, amount of uh, cash that would be required to meet the fines. Uh, then, so it's hard to find the right, the right way to do it. But the, placing a person in authority in jail who was within the corporate structure does, does uh, bring home a really strong message. No kidding. That's right. Mm -hmm. Have you ever... Uh attempted to work on uh, or have worked on any um, different laws or regulations that have to do with uh, disasters or working conditions? Not really. No, I, 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 this was likely the most important one that I, I dealt with. Yeah, and, uh, I, you know, it was, it, was, it was rewarding to see that in the end we, we did put a law in place that most people felt was going to be helpful in, in bringing public attention to uh, those in, in authority. And so I, I think that's about all you can ever accomplish sometimes as a parliamentarian is, is, is trying to outline the boundaries of what, what is accepted and what is not accepted within our society. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to add today? No, I don't. Well, I, I guess at the end of the day, you, you always um, say that uh, in doing this and working through the process, um, you learn so much as a parliamentarian, and I believe that um, you hopefully uh, have raised some degree of awareness within you as a parliamentarian that you will carry forward in the days when you're not in parliament and use in other ways. And I will say that in looking at these human beings who lost their lives, I mean, you, you realize that's the ultimate sacrifice that these folks have, have, have given up. And... Uh, and for what you say, um, and I think that's what gets you uh, entangled in the concept of human rights generally, and where you find that um, 
in going forward, looking at every individual as being a valued person within society and trying to find ways to make sure that we do live up to our constitutional obligations because our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is entrenched within our Constitution, includes protecting that person. And uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, each of us really needs to be uh, encouraged to look at uh, every person as, a, as an extremely valuable being and to do everything possible to let them live the fullest extent that they can within our country. And part of that means protecting the person. And I think that's, if there was anything that you come away with uh, from a parliamentary experience as we did in this West Dray Mine is, um, we need to make sure that we don't have these disasters and that people do go home every night to their families and that they do have a, a, a an economic base that's safe and secure so that they can they can uh, support that family. And unfortunately, that's where these situations uh, have led us into uh, massive problems. And it, yes, they don't, they don't cease. Uh, there's always someone who's out there seemingly making mistakes. But I think that uh, each of us should be trying to make sure that we do protect each other. And um, simple message, but I think that's really what we're trying to do. And I, and I think that uh, uh, Westray at least was a huge reminder, if nothing else. Thank you.